Okay, so this is a brief version of chapter nine. Okay, so the terms sex and gender are often used interchangeably, but sociologists define them very differently. So sex refers to an individual's membership in one of two biologically distinct categories, male or female, right? So sometimes in our society, we see them these terms used interchangeably, like on a job application, it might say select your gender instead of your sex. Um, you know, this is an inappropriate use of the term gender. Gender is a little bit different. Gender refers to the social actions, right? So it's really interesting that, that even when it comes to um, sex and gender, we understand that gender is something that's socially constructed and we see sex as something that's biologically constructed. So really we see sex and gender as two distinct things because sex is the biological category, right, of XY or XX, and gender is the social category of what it means to be a man or a woman. So this can also be a little bit more confusing because when it comes to sex, we assume that these things are, um, you know, biologically determined, meaning that there are only two biological sexes, male or female. But technically, um, there are five biological sexes. So even the, the idea that there's only male or female is itself socially constructed, meaning it's a way that we explain the world for ourselves to give ourselves easier answers, but actually it's much more common than you would think. Um, so when it comes to um, those five categories of sex, actually about one baby in a thousand is born intersexed, meaning having some characteristics of one or both of the sexes, right? So meaning um, sometimes people are born um, with female chromosomes, XX, but with male sex characteristics. Um, some people are born hermaphroditic, meaning that they have both. And other people are born with male chromosomes, XY, but with female sex characteristics. And sometimes these, some of these, depending on, some of them are chromosomal, some of them are, you know, um, based on different things. And it's interesting that some don't even um, make, their, make themselves known until adolescence, right? So some people might grow up thinking they are biologically one um, category, and then in adolescence find out that they're actually not, right? And so this is a very complicated thing because one in a thousand babies is born intersexed, which is much more common than Down syndrome or cerebral palsy or any of those kind of conditions. Though we've heard of those conditions, why have we not heard about intersexed people when it's that common? Well, because it shakes up our whole foundation of how we understand and organize society. If we organize society to say you are this or that, having three other categories is something that we're not really comfortable with, right? Because then that means that we have to explain a lot more. Even if those other categories are statistically smaller, right? Obviously, overwhelmingly, people are in the category of XX or XY, phenotypically male or female. But the idea that one in a thousand people born today aren't means we should actually acknowledge that those people exist, right? Because they do. And if we're looking at it from a scientific point of view, then let's actually use the science, right? And acknowledge that there are five categories. So again, gender is a little bit different than this because gender is referring to something altogether different, right? So gender is really referring to, um, you know, the social characteristics, meaning what we expect, how we expect people to behave. So what does it mean to be a man or a woman? That's what gender is. Okay, so here's a couple distinctions here. You know, the, the two main sex categories that we acknowledge. Um, you know, obviously this is the table from your book that talks about these sex characteristics. But again, one in 1,000 babies is born intersexed, meaning that these are not the only distinctions, right? So, of course, there's chromosomal, hormonal differences, obviously differences in reproductive organs and secondary sex characteristics, such as body hair, skin texture, proportions, all that kind of stuff. So gender is different, right? Gender refers to the physical, behavioral, and personality traits that a group considers normal for its male and female members. So gender is a term that describes our behaviors as feminine or masculine. In our society, it's often expected that women will behave in feminine ways and men will behave in masculine ways. Of course, we all know individuals who don't fit this description or behave with varying degrees of femininity or masculinity. 
And these individuals sometimes face sanctions or negative stereotypes because their behavior contradicts the expectations of society. So, you know, gender identity um, refers to an individual's self-definition or sense of their gender, while gender expression refers to an individual's behavioral manifestations of gender. So gender is really better understood as a continuum rather than a dichotomy of you are this or you are that. The idea is we all fall somewhere on that continuum of our expressed identity and of you know how we, our expression and our identity of how we act and how we feel internally. So there's different ways that people have understood this over time, right? Oh, and I should, I should also clarify, the term gender identity, you know, it's, it's your self-definition, right? So it's how you feel and how you manifest your behavior based on your feelings. All right, so there's different groups of people and how they understand this. Essentialists see gender as biological or genetic, and they believe that gender is simply two categories, binary, meaning you are this or you are that, you know, despite the fact that there's actual facts that show that there are five biological sexes. They're like, nah, it doesn't matter. There's only two, right? Which is not scientific, but whatever. Um, so they say this is determined by your chromosomes, your, homo your hormones, and your genitalia, which in a way you would think, again, based on science, you would see variations, but whatever. So they believe, essentialists believe that gender and sex are connected, that they are permanent and unchanging, right? So essentialists are generally non-sociologists, obviously. They often are in fields like medicine, theology, biology, but sometimes sociologists in certain subfields like sociobiology adhere to this principle, but most sociologists use a constructionist approach, meaning that they see sex, gender, and sexuality as social constructs, meaning you know, constructionists believe that gender is created or constructed through our interactions with each other in society, and so in the U.S., we tend to classify people as being male or female, but other societies have different classification systems, some of which are mentioned specifically in your textbook in Chapter 9, right? And people are treated differently based on the norms associated with that system. So, for instance, queer theorists emphasize the importance of difference and reject ideas of innate identities or restrictive categories of gender and sexual identity. They say that even our understandings of sex are very socially constructed, right? who's supposed to have sex with whom, what is supposed to be desirable, those things are really dictated by your culture and your society. So when it comes to sexuality and sexual orientation, sexual orientation is the inclination to be heterosexual or homosexual or bisexual. Those who are asexual may simply reject any sexual identity at all. I feel like asexuality is the one that people have the hardest time with. There's really, you know, um, this, this kind of idea that even with sexuality for a long time, we thought of it as a binary, right? You are this or you are that. Because it's really easy to classify everything as this or that. So people do that because they want an easy way to look at the world. But that's not what the world actually is, right? If it was, it'd be terribly boring. So when it comes to orientation, there's so much variation. Um, but we only really, even to this day, kind of accept the idea of heterosexuality, homosexuality, or bisexuality. Though I will show you a clip um, later on that gets into the kind of idea of how these categories and understandings of sexual identity are changing in the modern day as people are talking about, you know, um, panromantic or pansexual or these kind of, you know, new categories that also include people that are not gender conforming. So what's the difference between panromantic and bisexual? Bisexual just means you would be attracted to either sex, right? But that's according to the binary sex system, right? Males or females. Being pansexual means you would be attracted to anyone, meaning male, female, or someone who isn't gender binary, someone who's trans, or someone who just does not adhere to a gender norm, right? Meaning that you're just kind of open, <laughs> right? So these things are actually changing dynamically right now. So even the terminology that we have is going to be shifting because of these people uh, expressing their identities differently in our, in our you know, modern time period. Um, so, you know, there, are, there is some evidence of a biological component to sexual orientation, right? But the research is still preliminary, meaning, you know, sometimes um, 
uh, like some researchers looked at twin studies, some have looked at birth order um, and relationships to homosexuality. So a lot of embrace the idea though that sexual orientation is genetic and based on the idea that if sexuality is innate, then if you discriminate against a person because of their sexuality, that's terrible, right? Because you're basically just like with race or gender or anything else, you're discriminating against something that someone didn't have the ability to choose, right? So most Americans are still, um, you know, supportive of civil unions. A lot of people are still mixed on same-sex marriage, but of course, you know, recent um, political changes have made this the law of the land, thankfully. So, you know, it's interesting that this, this idea of orientation and this really idea of who deserves what's rights comes from these, you know, mixed or often misunderstandings about these categories. But it's really interesting when you look at Kinsey's research, you can see that these ideas aren't new, right? It's not like we just invented sexuality. It feels like every generation thinks that they're the first ones to, you know, have a sexuality, right? It's probably because people don't want to think about their parents having a sexuality or their grandparents, but they did, or you would not be here, right? So Kinsey, he suggested that human sexuality was far more diverse than people commonly assumed. And his own studies led him to believe that people were not inclined to be actually exclusively heterosexual or exclusively homosexual, but would rather fall into a spectrum, the six point spectrum I have here at the bottom of the slide, actually. This is the one that Kinsey used. He called it the Kinsey scale of sexuality, which is an early example of queering the binary, meaning rejecting heteronormative categories of sexuality and acknowledging that there's more than this or that, right? And what's interesting about Kinsey's research is that it was a bombshell at the time it hit America because the majority, it was research conducted on thousands of people and the majority of people fell somewhere in the spectrum, not at zero, not at six, but somewhere between two and four. And what's interesting is that um, this research that Kinsey did was in the 1950s, right? That idyllic, beautiful, somehow squeaky clean in our minds version of America was actually when he found quite a bit of variation when it came to uh, much more diverse ideas of sexuality than you know previous researchers have been able to find. So when it comes to inequalities of sex, gender, and sexuality, sex, gender, and sexuality are all bases of hierarchies of inequality, like we talked about with social class, right? So first up is homophobia, right? Which is the fear of or discrimination towards homosexuals or towards individuals who display any sort of non-gender appropriate behavior, right? So someone that is effeminate, that's a male, or a, a girl that's aggressive, or something like that. Um, oftentimes, homophobia is used as a way to control the actions of people so that they fall in line with what society dictates. Meaning, um, for men, if men um, cry, if men hug each other, if men show any sort of emotion whatsoever, typically, um, you know, oftentimes there are homophobic slurs or words that are thrown at men to make them feel um, inadequate to make them feel like um, afraid of portraying themselves in a way that is not masculine, right? Because if they don't, they're going to be called gay. There's so many words, right, that we use to shame men. And it's really sad, too, because first of all, it assumes at a baseline that there's something wrong with being homosexual, which is horrible to say. And at the same time, it also polices men into this horrible way where they can't express emotions, they can't cry, and they can't be a full human person um, because they're afraid that someone's going to call them fag or someone's going to beat them up or harass them, right? And it really shows the hierarchy. The hierarchy is heterosexual above homosexual. So if you're called a homosexual, it's supposed to be an insult, just like if you, uh, the hierarchy of men above women in the gender system, if, a, if someone says you throw like a girl, right? That's supposed to be offensive, which it isn't to me because I was a pitcher for several years. So I'm like, yeah, I totally do. And I kick ass. But anyway, it's that idea that, that we have a hierarchy when it comes to sexuality, when it comes to gender, when it comes to sex. And this is a problem because people are then policed into these categories of sex, gender, and sexuality because of the fear of being labeled or stigmatized or harassed, right? So homophobia is one of those ones where it really polices men 
and their ability. Like men will have to say horrible things like, like um, if they hug each other or have any expression of emotion, they have to like, okay, but this isn't gay. Like as if someone would assume that. Why, why is it then that women are allowed to hug each other or be close and have close relationships, but they're not assumed to be homosexuals? Right? And even then, this idea that being assumed to be a homosexual is somehow a horrible thing is, again, what the society is dictating based on the hierarchy. So when you look at oppressed groups, what you also have to look at is who is not oppressed. Right? So if, if women are bad for crying and being weak in the society, right? And that's the, the characterization of women, then who's being privileged by that? Men because they're so strong and powerful, right? Or, you know, the same thing with, with uh, heterosexuality or homosexuality, right? We'll, we'll continue to talk about this in a very intersectional way when it comes to race as well. So, you know, obviously there's been a lot of change in recent years, but homophobia is still a problem in our American society. And, you know, some argue the term homophobia represents a biased attitude because of the term phobia. Um, it's really showing that, you know, it's, it's almost like a psychological problem that people have where it's like a, they, they can't see that people are human people, right? Um, and gender inequality itself can be found in all sorts of past and present societies, can be traced back to all sorts of differences in early societies. So the activities that, you know, um, that women and men could participate in were different after, you know, um, or at least, you know, archaeologists would argue after the Ice Ages when women um, kind of needed more iron in order to weather childbirth and periods and all that kind of fun stuff, um, that oftentimes this kind of led to more of a um, hunter-gatherer lifestyle. But again, it's funny the way that we look back at the hunter-gatherer situation, because what do we do? We put it on our current hierarchy, meaning, like, let's just look at it blankly. Let's just say you're in a group, like, it's the walking dead. You're just out there in, in the fields, right? You're out there in the woods. And except for the zombies, like no zombies, but you're out there <laughs> trying to forage to survive. Let's say one group, like you're, there's two groups in your society. One group brings in 80% of the food. One group brings in 20% of the food. Which one's more valuable to you? The 80% of the food that sustains you throughout the year or the 20% of the food that is often rare or um, can be larger kind of food items, but only 20% of the time you would typically put more value on the 80%, right? Because that's how math works, right? See, but that's not how we look at hunter-gatherer societies. In hunter-gatherer societies, women foraged about 80% of the food. Yet we still have this like warrior men, they went out and killed animals and blah, and this kind of like weird testosterone crap that we link to that. Though if you actually read, um, you know, the work of actual you know, history and archaeologists, there's a lot that's really not known or not said, and there's a lot of values we're putting on things after the fact. Kind of like the idea that at Stonehenge, they found that um, half of the warriors that are buried there are women, right? And that was kind of a new thing, the idea that there were Viking women warriors. So yeah, we tend to use our gauge of what society is now and apply it to the past without actually having all the facts. Um, which can really skew our opinion of, you know, who's right, who's wrong, what's valuable and what's not. So we still have a lot of weird hangups based on all sorts of crap from the past. Plus, our language and vocabulary tend to reflect a hierarchical system of gender inequality, right? Meaning, you know, if you, you know, on, on page 26 of your book, they really get into this, right? Like, what's the difference between a stud and a slut? It's like, well, there's a big difference, right? There's this idea that if a man is hypersexual, has a lot of sex partners, that that's good, that he's cool. But if a woman has a lot of sex partners, right, she's disgusting. That's terrible. It's like, why? Because when you look at the sexual scripts, the expectations that we have of how men act and how women act, men are supposed to be the aggressors. Women are supposed to be passive and just, oh no, you know, <laughs> and all this kind of like the gatekeepers of their vaginas. And so in a way, this causes this really messed up uh, script for men and women to follow when it comes to actual relationships, um, meaning that a girl could make out with someone and be considered a slut and uh, a guy oftentimes will feel like he needs to have sex with multiple people just to feel like good enough in the eyes of his male companions, right? And that's a problem when you make people feel horrible to like kind of drive them towards something. It's very coercive, right? Um, also, when you look at the way that we refer to women, um, a lot of words that we call women are either like babies or, you know, stuff like that, like chicks or 
you know, um, yeah, baby, doll, sugar, like a lot of these things that we call women um, are really derogatory, but we don't realize it. Like it took me so many years to get past the word chick. Like I still say it all the time, but it's interesting what those words really mean when you look at it from a linguistic point of view, right? Language structures our thoughts. Language controls what you can see or think. What does it mean if you have all these words in a society that compare women to baby animals or to animals in general, like a bitch, right? Like what, what does it mean that, that we have all those kind of words? It means that in the society, the value system of a woman is she's something that's less than, that's not as human, that's something that needs to either be taken care of or controlled, right? So that's a problem, <laughs> right? Versus a lot of the things that we think of, um, you know, like man-made, mankind, manpower, manslaughter, right? There's a lot of these words that, that have the root man in them. And it's interesting because I'm one of those, um, I'm like the first generation that um, the feminists of the 1970s like started um, experimenting on, I guess is a nice way to put it. No, I'm just kidding. Um, it was great. They basically changed the language of certain words so that we could see possibilities for women in those roles as we grew up, meaning they changed words like policeman to police officer, fireman to firefighter, right? When you think of, of a police officer or firefighter, you probably think of a man, right? In your mind. But the idea is the word itself does not exclusively say it's only for men. And so that's something that's been, you know, kind of changed in the last generation or so. And we're really one of the first generations to grow up with that kind of mindset. Has it completely changed that gender distinction? Of course not, right? But it is interesting that by having those words as a, in a more gender neutral tone, you give the possibility, right? Like male man is male carrier, right? Why is why postal worker could be a male or a woman, right? But if you say mailman, it's the man who brings your mail, right? The milkman, right? It's the man who brings your milk. It's it's pretty straightforward in that way. So, you know, there's a lot of sociological theories that are going to try and explain why this has persisted, but a lot of it does have to do with our language. So we have to be cognizant of what we say and how we talk, because in a way we might unintentionally be reifying inequality, right? We don't want to do that. So we're going to discuss some of those theories. So functionalists believe that there are social roles that are better suited to one gender than the other. And they believe that societies are more stable when tasks are done by the quote, appropriate sex, right? Again, remember functionalists are kind of old timey. They're like 1920s, 30s, 40s. Anyway, so functionalists tend to believe that society functions the way it does as a result of men and women having different roles and tasks. So functionalists would likely agree that sometimes these differences result in inequalities, but they argue there's a purpose for the inequality in society, right? So first, Talcott Parsons basically says that men are more suited for instrumental roles. Instrumental roles are basically um, the breadwinner, right? The person who provides the family's material support and is often an authority figure. And he argues that women are more suited for expressive roles, meaning the person who provides the emotional support and the nurturing. So of course, Tom Carr Parsons was a functionalist. And while it may be true that men and women have traditionally filled gender specific roles, many contemporary theories argue that it's not that men are just like born better suited for that or women are born better suited for that. It's a result of our socialization meaning we've been taught to behave differently our whole lives. Guess what? We behave differently. You know, that's kind of the result of that socialization, right? Versus conflict theorists believe men have historically had access to most of society's material resources and privileges, meaning that therefore it's in their own interest to maintain their dominant position. So conflict theorists point out that men stand to lose a great deal if gender inequality disappears. For example, they'd have to do more unpaid work, right? They'd have to take care of their own kids, clean up their own house, do their own dishes, God forbid, right? Um, you know, have to help out. Conflict theorists are really interested in the imbalance of power that goes on in society and the struggles that people go through to try to gain access to power, you know, to which they traditionally don't have access to. So in many societies, it's clear that women have not had access to power and oftentimes still do not have access to power. 
So gender inequality can be found in a lot of past and present societies. So it invariably takes the form of patriarchy, which is just a term for, you know, the male control or domination of a, of a culture. So when it comes to um, interactionists, interactionists emphasize how the concept of gender is socially constructed, maintained, and reproduced in our everyday lives. So remember, interactionists say that we, you know, basically that gender is shaped through our culture and our interaction with each other. So the idea that gender is, quote, reproduced means that adults have learned your gender role and they teach those roles to their children and then they reinforce those gender norms on those kids, perpetuating or reproducing the gender roles generation by generation, right? Like, so my mom gets socialized to be feminine. So when I'm a kid, she says, you know, cross your legs, be a lady, sit up straight, all that kind of crap, you know, don't get dirty because you're a girl or those kind of things. And those things get passed on generationally, right? We also, we don't realize how much power we have as far as interactionists argue interactionists say we could just choose not to perform gender or perform gender differently. And you can actually see a lot of this happening right now. The systems of gender have really been challenged in the last 20 years um, where women are saying, no, I'm still feminine, but I'm not shaving my legs or my armpits or whatever it might be. Um, just pushing back against those kind of expected, you know, um, you know, expectations of, of how you should act or how you should look or how you should be based on something as arbitrary as a cultural gender role, right? And so feminist theorists apply assumptions about gender inequalities to social institutions to illuminate how gender inequality affects all areas of social life. So how you're seen in school is affected by your gender. How you're seen in your home, like in your family. How you're seen in religion is affected by gender, right? In the government, in politics, in the economy. And that's an important distinction. So it's, it's one thing to just think men are better than women and have that be your own personal prejudice. But when it comes to these inequalities, they are often built into the social institutions themselves, meaning that there's inequality built into government, built into the economy, built into whatever. And we can see all sorts of manifestations of these things. Okay, so this again is just here for you guys. Hint, hint, for your theory papers. You should be caring about that. That is coming up. Even though I've been crazy sick, it's coming up. Okay, so um, general socialization. So general socialization is the lifelong process of learning to be masculine or feminine, primarily through four main agents of socialization, your family, school, peers, and the media. So families are usually the primary source of socialization, and of course, as a result, that greatly impacts our gender role socialization. So children are exposed to their families as their primary agent, and oftentimes this can be the only agent of socialization that a child experiences until they go to school. You know, so you can think about that. Your family is going to have a pretty strong lasting impact. So social learning theory suggests that babies and children learn behaviors and meanings through social interaction and internalize the expectations of those around them. According to social learning theory, children tend to mimic significant role models in their lives for instance, a boy sees his father working on the car. The boy looks up to his father and identifies with his father's biological sex. So the boy learns indirectly through observation that it's a man's job to work on a car. And he internalizes that expectation for himself as well. So through that example, the boy experiences gender role socialization. So, you know, you can think about this in your own lives. You know, if you've ever been told that a certain behavior wasn't appropriate because you're a boy or a girl if you've ever received a harsh punishment because you did something that was, you know, unbeknownst to your gender. So, you know, sometimes it can be hard to see how gender is socially constructed, but oftentimes when you look at your own life, you can think of the times that people have policed you when you've gotten near the boundaries of gender. So schools also socialize children into gender roles that accord with their sex. So for instance, research shows that teachers treat boys and girls differently and this teaches children that there are different expectations for them based on sex. So schools are generally the first agent of socialization that children experience outside of their immediate families. This may be the first time that children are introduced to thoughts and ideas that contradict those of their families. So schools are very important in, as an agent of socialization. And the messages that students receive in schools can have a big impact on the way children think about themselves. 
So research shows that in school, teachers tend to favor boys in several ways. Boys receive more attention and instructional time in the classroom. They're more likely to be called on in class or posed with more challenging questions or tasks. And they're often given more praise for the quality of their work. So what message does that send to the boys in the class? That they're superior, that they're the best, they're whatever. What message does that send to the girls in the class? Right? And so a lot of um, educational scholars have looked at this over time to see how these dynamics affect you know, um, educational outcomes for men and women. So in Western societies, peer groups are obviously an important agent of socialization because teens are rewarded by their peers when they conform to gender norms and they're stigmatized when they don't. So in fact, many sociologists argue that peer groups are the most dominant agent of socialization, especially once you get to middle school all the way through adulthood. So for example, as teens, boys tend to gain prestige through athletic ability, their sense of humor, or by taking risks. But girls, on the other hand, tend to gain prestige through social position and physical attractiveness. So when teens receive praise or punishment, they're learning which behaviors are acceptable and which are not based on their gender. So there's no question that sexual behavior is portrayed in a highly stereotypical manner in all forms in the media, television, movies, magazine, books, video games, and so on. The media is highly controversial agent of socialization because we know the media impacts us but there's a lot of debate about how much we're impacted by the media. So we can note in recent decades that we've seen some interesting correlations. Female models have gotten thinner. Male actors have gotten more muscular. Both boys and girls are experiencing higher rates of depression, more cases of anorexia and bulimia, and greater issues of self-esteem and self-worth. You know, there are some you know, exceptions where the media pushes back, but overall the media is giving us a very toxic message, hence why I had you watch the film Misrepresentation. So sex and gender affect every significant aspect of our lives. Even our lifespan is different depending on sex. So females that were born in 2013 are expected to live an average of 81.2 years, while males are expected to live 76.4 years. So even your lifespan is affected by your gender. Women are disadvantaged on institutional setting in our society. Um, compared to men, women are more likely to do a disproportionate amount of housework, um, meaning that women are more likely to work what is called a second shift. So the second shift is a term coined by Arlie Hochschild that refers to unpaid work, meaning cooking, cleaning, laundry, childcare, home repair, yard work, all that crap no one wants to do, that must be done at home after the day's paid labor is complete. So when you think about it, a lot, of, a lot of women are expected, even though they work outside the home, to come home and do all of these kind of things. Also, um, women are likely to earn less than their male peers at work, which causes all sorts of problems, not just for income, but for wealth and for your retirement, right? For your whole future. And as a result, women are more likely to live in poverty, what we call the feminization of poverty. So well, you can see the difference here too as well when it comes to um, the, er the female to male earnings ratio, um, it's really interesting that less than women's pay going up, it's actually men's earnings coming down from the 70s on that's actually causing a decrease in the gap between men and women. So the feminization of poverty refers to the economic trend that women are more likely to live in poverty due in part to gender gap in wages. There's a lot of reasons. High proportion of single mothers compared to single fathers, right? Like 98% of single parents are women. Um, and everyone knows it's much harder to be a single parent and financially support your family, especially in a time period where dual earning families is like the expectation. And so the cost of childcare can cause a lot of problems for this. In our state of California, it costs as much to send your kid to a decent child care as it does to a state university per year, which is nuts, right? That's totally nuts. So the gender gap in wages has contributed in part to the feminization of poverty as well. So the women's movement, right? The women's movement really brought about different understandings and positions for women within, this, within society. So first, you know, the thing that links every wave of the women's rights movement together is feminism, right? The, the, the belief system, the 
philosophical belief system of feminism. So feminism is just the belief in the social, political, and economic equality of the sexes and the social movements that are organized around that belief. So basically, if you think that men and women should get paid the same for the same job, you're a feminist, right? Like, it's that easy. Um, actually, it's, <laughs> it's really great. Um, Aziz Ansari does a great joke about that, right, where he says... Um, People hate using the word feminist because there's been a culture war against it for a lot of years where somehow being a feminist was such a terrible thing. And they talked about that a little bit in the film, right? Um, so Aziz Ansari made a joke about how, like, he'll tell people, like, yeah, I'm a feminist. Like, that's what that means. Like, if you think that people should have equal rights, then that's what you believe. And he said, um, you know, it's like someone saying, um, oh, I... I study diseases, I'm a doctor that studied diseases of the skin. And they're like, oh, you're a dermatologist? No, 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 that term is way too harsh. No, 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 I don't, I don't, I don't like being defined that way, <laughs> right? That's kind of the way he's trying to make that analogy. It's like the belief is enough, but the stigma of the word, it's what a lot of people refer to as the other F word, right? That somehow it, it's such a stigma in our culture. And there's a lot of powerful financial reasons for that, right? A lot of people that have paid a lot of money to make you feel that way. So in the US, the history of the women's movement can be divided into three historical waves. The first wave is, you know, the mid 19th century through 1920. Um, it's supposed to be the 1948 Seneca Falls Convention, though I just read a thing like a month ago about how actually 11 years earlier was um, what they think is the first meeting of any group that, of women abolitionists that were the first to actually meet. So in the 1830s, let's just, let's just throw it that way. 1830, 1920, um, this is focused mostly on gaining suffrage for women and of course abolition movements um, before that was, before slavery was abolished. But um, basically a lot of these women were fighting against slavery and they had organized all these things to try and boycott it. And then they realized, hey, maybe we should fight for our rights too, <laughs> right? So suffrage is just gaining the right to vote. Um, so women got the right to vote in 1920, uh, first wave kind of petered out, and it wasn't until the 60s that we got the second wave of the feminist rights movement, or the, the women's rights movement. Um, the 60s and 70s, this is really where all of those categories exploded for women, meaning women were given access to all sorts of things they were historically kept out of, meaning before the 60s, most jobs were not open to women, especially prestigious jobs. Right. Um, there were a lot of educational institutions that could just outright deny women or not give them the same opportunities. Actually, it's really interesting. The first colleges that really came on the scene for women were called finishing schools. And they were simply a place where you could learn to sew and do things like that. Right. Um, so and even those women that were able to, in, you know, in the first wave time period, get degrees and go to college, um, they were extremely wealthy and privileged. Right. So. The second wave was focusing more on kind of the middle class woman. Um, but of course, nowadays, it's kind of more what we would call white feminism, um, focusing on the, the languishing housewife, right, that, that um, has no um, ability to kind of live outside of the world of, of her home and her children and her family. And again, this idea is that if you're expected to do all of these things and no one ever says thank you, how much value can you get out of what you do, right? Um, so for a lot of women... Um, it wasn't just employment and education, it was also sexual liberation and freedom, right? This coming about in the same kind of sexual liberation time period, women got access to birth control, which meant that they could control when they had children and when they didn't, which means it's a hell of a lot easier to go to school when you know you're not going to have a kid, right? It's, it's a lot easier to, to get a, a good job and stay in a good career track when you can control how many children you have. Right? So that was kind of an important landmark in that also for women. So, um, you know, the, the 60s and 70s were characterized by all sorts of changes um, in the political and cultural landscape for women. Um, you know, Title IX that said that, you know, educational systems had to be equal. All of those kind of things were very important. And then um, you get to the 1980s, which in that film I showed you, they talked about it. Uh, the, the very famous feminist talked about uh, <laughs> the, quote, wake up call of the 1980s, right? When um, very conservative thinkers took over, um, a lot of money was spent to basically make feminism a bad word, to challenge and, you know, question them, to say every bad thing that happened in the whole culture was the result of women not knowing their place, dot, 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 right? So, um, yeah, third wave, 
it's really different than the other waves. So third wave is much more focused on the diversity among women's experiences and identities. So, you know, there's often this argument that second wave was white feminism, right? Focusing more on like middle-class white women and their needs. Third wave is much more focusing on um, not just white women, um, women like trans women, disabled women, women of color, uh, women all over the world, right? Women that um, are marginalized in other kind of places and identities around the world. And also men, right? The men's movement, male liberation. This originated from feminist theory as well. I mean, it's subsequently split into two groups. You have those creepy MRA guys, uh, the, you know, male men's rights people. And then you have what's called the pro-feminist men's movement, meaning the ones that realize that gender is a thing um, and aren't like, it's, it's bizarre, right? Like, um, it's bizarre that the men's rights people think that feminists don't care about men because the word feminist, right? That doesn't mean, it's literally about the equality of the sexes. So why would that mean not men? That's, men are part of that. Um, the difference is, is that when you have um, control, when you are um, in an, a kind of like a, a powerful position, equality can feel like oppression to you, right? It can feel like somehow something's being taken away from you because now you're on an equal playing field. But that's just not the case. Uh, feminist movement has been since the 80s looking at issues of gender as a problem, meaning it's not just about the bad things gender does to women, it's also about the terrible things gender does to men, like not letting them express their emotions. The fact that a lot of these things, like I showed you that Jackson Katz clip from his documentary Tough Guys 2 that really gets into how the culture says masculinity is such a strict thing that men aren't allowed to express themselves in any ways other than violence, anger, aggression. And that's really bad because a lot of men either act out violently towards, you know, the women and their loved ones in their life or often commit suicide or, you know, just horrible things because they're not given the opportunity to feel secure in their masculinity through the culture, right? So it's so stupid to me that these men's rights people think feminists don't care about men's problems. They'll say like, oh, well, you know, men are also objectified. Men are also this. And you're like, well, yeah, and that's terrible. Like who was ever saying that that wasn't, a, just because you focus on it's bad to oppress women doesn't mean it's okay to oppress men. Like it's such a weird, like why would anyone think that, right? It's such a bizarre flip side of the coin. But, um, you know, there's still a very strong movement of what's called the pro-feminist men's movement, meaning people like Michael Kimmel, Jackson Katz, like the one I showed you, um, in class that are scholars of masculinity. The look at the ways that our culture is very toxic to men um, creates what's called a bro code and really, you know, can affect their psychological, emotional, and just whole spiritual development. And so, you know, um, obviously the pro-feminist movement understands that sexism harms men and women, but the men's rights people think that feminism has created inequality for men that, that feminists want to like oppress men or something which is bizarre so um it's really just kind of a misunderstanding of what's going on there when it comes to reality <laughs> and that's kind of a big deal if you look at our politics nowadays um there's a lot of misunderstandings that people have so that's why i say if you have any of those kind of misunderstandings maybe you should coach those things in reading your book and looking at some of the factual analysis on these things, right? It can be very easy to get swept up in the emotionality of the us versus them dichotomy kind of stuff. You're this or you're that. Um, but that's not the world. That's a lie that we're being sold through our socialization to make everything look kind of easy peasy for us. Stop crying. Stop with the tears. Don't cry. Pick yourself up. Stop with the emotion. Don't be a pussy. Don't let nobody disrespect you. Be cool and be kind of a dick. Always keep your mouth shut. Nobody likes a tattletale. Bros come before hoes. Don't let your woman run your you life. You bitch. What a fag. Get laid. Do something. Be a man. Be a man. Grow some balls. The three most destructive words that every man receives when he's a boy is when he's told to be a man. We've constructed an idea of masculinity in the United States that doesn't give young boys a way to feel secure in their masculinity. So we make them go prove it all the time. Within their peer group culture, each of them is posturing based on how the other boys are posturing. And what they end up missing is what they each really want, which is just that closeness. 
in good times, guys are like really close to each other. But when things get a little bit worse, you're on your own. From middle school, I had four really close friends. But once I kind of went into high school, I struggle finding people I can talk to because I feel like I'm not supposed to get help. Our kids get up every morning. They have to prepare their mask for how they're going to walk to school. A lot of our students don't know how to take the mask off. What is it you don't let people see? Almost 90% of you have pain and anger on the back of that paper. If you never cry, then you have all these feelings stuffed up inside of you, and then you can't get them out. They really buy into the, a culture that doesn't value what we've feminized. If we're in a culture that doesn't value caring, doesn't value relationships, doesn't value empathy, you are going to have boys and girls, men and women, go crazy. I had anger issues in high school. I felt like an outcast. I've been suspended at least once every year I was here. We would just look for trouble and just like try to fight. Boys are more likely to act out. They're more likely to become aggressive. Most people miss that as depression or see it as a conduct disorder or just a bad kid. I felt like just giving up on life. You know, I actually had suicide thought to my head at sixth grade. I felt alone for, for a long time, and I actually thought about killing myself. Whether it's homicidal violence or suicidal violence, people resort to such desperate behavior only when they are feeling shamed and humiliated or feel they would be if they didn't prove that they were real men. If you're told from day one, don't let nobody disrespect you, and this is the way you handle it as a man, respect is linked to violence. If I can man up, why step down from that, you feel me? It's like instinct. So man up. Man up. Man up. Man up. Man up. Some fucking ball. Act like a man. Be a man. Be a man. For my kids, I was gonna end this hyper-masculine narrative here.